So again, this is the last lecture that will be on the exam. And if I ask you anything about this, uh, it'll, it'll just be qualitative. I mean, what we're going to talk about today is just sort of qualitative. It's, there's nothing to compute here. Uh, but really, it, it ties a lot of the things we've been talking about together <coughs> in a case study. So in th this is a, uh, a real case study that was performed on uh, a series of wells that they were drilling in uh, Cook Inlet in Alaska. And so in this area, they had s drilled some vertical wells, and they were going to come in and do uh, a series of um, multilaterals from those horizontal wells. And the question was, that we're trying to answer in doing this case study was, do we need to case the wells? Right? Do we need to, specifically, do we need to case the, the laterals, the multilaterals that are coming off the, hor the vertical wells? And so to answer that question, it's sort of a multi, it's not just one thing you have to consider, but several. I mean, one, you have to consider the wellbore stability while you're drilling. Uh, the second that you need to consider, well, it's, it's not necessarily uh, in the decision of casing the well or not, but something you can do uh, since you have the model is to determine um, the, the vertical height at which, at where you can do the kickoffs. Because when you when you kick off on from the vertical well, you want the rock strength to be as high as possible in those areas. And and then the last thing is something new we haven't really talked about because it really to talk about it in detail kind of goes beyond the scope of this class but we'll, we'll sort of talk about it at a high level today. And that has to do with the stability of the wells during production, which in fact can be more restrictive than, than, than while drilling. Okay. And so uh, what you see here is a lower hemisphere projection plot. Uh, and in this case, it's not necessarily one thing. It's not required CO or, or wellbore breakout width or anything like that, but rather just Let's call it a stability plot, right? So, in um, you know, so remember, in the, in the lower hemisphere projection plot, uh, as you you go around, these are azimuths of drilling, and then as you as you move away from the center, this is a 30 degree deviation, 60 degree deviation, 90 degree deviation line. So, the the on the outer edge, these would be perfectly horizontal wells, right? And we've, we've seen some of these, and we've, we've created one. They've always been perfectly symmetric. Right? And this one you see here is not perfectly symmetric. It has, it has some anti-symmetry here. And that has to do with the fact that in this case, there was a, they had enough information from vertical wells that were drilled around the area that they, I mean, obviously, the, the whole world is, or, or even, one, you know, even one reservoir is not just one unconfined compressive stream. Right? So in this, in this case, they actually had enough information that from the horizontal wells that they could map out sort of a heterogeneity in the unconfined compressive strengths. So as you drilled in certain directions, you'd, you'd encounter different strength rock. And that's where you see some of the sort of anti-symmetry that you see here. But for the most part, uh, you can see if you drill in the direction, horizontal wells in the direction of SH max, uh, which would be to the sort of uh, northwest and, uh, and southeast, then these cool areas represent more stable wells and, and the, the red areas, the hot areas, represent less stable wells, meaning the rock needs, you know, if you're going to drill in that direction, if you want to ensure st stable wells, uh, the rock needs to be stronger. Um, you know, your, your tolerance for breakout widths needs to be higher. And, you know, also your required mud weight during drilling. And so, uh, by the way, this is discussed briefly in Zoback's book, but if you want more detail, it's discussed in this paper, uh, SP52186 uh, from 1999. So it's a conference paper, and there's more detail in here. Um, and they claim in the book that, <laughs> that this model was developed from, again, um, basically logging information from the horizontal, well, uh, from, the, from the vertical wells and also cores that were taken from vertical wells and laboratory measurements therein. And they, they, they make the claim that while they developed this uh, model sort of independent of information about the, these wells that were drilled, they then later found out 
I'm, I'm questioning that. They later found out that uh, there were a couple of wells drilled already, horizontal wells drilled already, uh, and the horizontal wells seemed to confirm uh, their geomechanical, you know, the correctness of their ge geomechanical model. And that is, uh, if you look here, There was a, a horizontal well drilled in this direction, which is sort of to the northeast. And so if you were to plot it on the lower hemisphere projection, it would be sort of in this area, right? And in that, in that case, the claim was that there were no problems with well, sort of well bore stability whatsoever. Uh, however, another well that was drilled I think I might have said northeast, obviously, that's northwest. Uh, there's another well that was drilled to the northeast here, uh, such that if you plotted it on the lower hemisphere projection, it would be there. And in this case, they encountered severe well war stability problems, such that uh, that little red piece on the end there indicated that in that uncased section, uh, there was actual total well bore collapse during production. So they lost the well in the area. Okay. So, so given this, you can uh, you have an idea of where it's safe to drill, if you will, right? The, the more stable well bores are going to be horizontal wells in these directions. Horizontal wells in, in the, those directions would be would require obviously require casing. So then the next question uh, would be, now that we sort of know which, which direction to drill, um, where would we kick off? Right? And so there were a series of laboratory measurements done such that they developed this empirical strength model. This should be, this should be MPA. Sorry for not putting the unit on there. They developed this empirical strength model from laboratory measurements uh, so that they could go into the field and use them, you know, while drilling using sonic measurements so that VP is the um, compressive sound speed of the material. Then they could determine, uh, approximately determine the unconfined compressive strength of the rock in that region. And that helped them to understand at what depth uh, to do the kickoffs. Right? Now, I'm not a huge fan of empirical models because they're limited. I mean, in this case, it's limited to this one region, this, you know, these series of wells only, right? So uh, the reason or argument for doing something more scientific is that you can be a little more general. So, you know, I always joke, anytime you see crazy coefficients like that in front of some numbers, it didn't come from F equals MA. Right? This is some empirical model. Right? And so this, this type of equation uh, gave them some information about, you know, while they were drilling to determine this, uh, where to do the kickoffs at, and do that, do those in the in the highest strength regions. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the unconfined compressor strength has a lot to do, a material's unconfined compressor strength has a lot to do with the, the sort of size and contact areas of the grains in a rock matrix. So if you imagine this is some size, some type of uh, consolidated sand, in fact it was, like a cementitious or conglomerated material. So it has a lot to do with the, with the, the size and contact areas of the grains in, in the rock. And so, if those are similar throughout the region, then you could say that you know, that would be, because that's going to have the most effect, the first order effect on density is going to be the heavier things in the material, right? And then, so I, I actually, for reasons I'll talk about in a second, uh, I think I've even mentioned this in class. I, I personally don't think. I think unconfined compressor strength is one of the 
most useless measurements for <laughs> for the actual behavior of a rock. Yet it's how we character. You know, like if you go in a lab and you say you pick up a rock and you ask the guy running the lab, well, you know, what's this rock's? You know, how do you? Pr how do you and he'll say, well, that's an unconsolidated sand of 5,000 PSI UCF, unconsolidated compression. So it's sort of the way you compare one rock to another. Yet it's one of the most useless measurements, in my opinion, because it doesn't take into any, cons it's just the unconfined compressive strength. Well, all the rocks we care about are under serious confinement, right? And they can behave much, much differently in, the, in those scenarios. <coughs> so nevertheless, you know, sometimes you just don't have enough information and, and you use what you can, right? So, so the last part, you know, now we know which direction to drill in. We know where we're going to do the kickoffs. So then the last question of whether we're going to case the wells or not, or the, the leave, it, leave the uh, multilaterals uncased, has to do with production. And in fact, this, this can, like I said earlier, can actually be more restrictive than drilling because during production, you, your you know, bottom hole pressure is less than a reservoir pressure, and that can cause a higher compressive area near the well bore. And so you can experience more breakouts. Or in the, in the, in the scenario that we're talking about production, we, tip, we typically talk, you know, breakouts, we call, them, we call, it, we call it sand production. Right? So these, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, sand production is just the, the common used term, but it could be any any reservoir solids that we're producing with reservoir fluids, right? And we we want to prevent this because you, you can't just stick the solids in the pipe and sell it. You have to you have to get rid of them somehow, right? So you have to deal with them at the surface. So if we can prevent sand production, we try to do that. And so in this case, and this is what goes beyond the scope of the class, they use a much more sophisticated model than what we've talked about, right? So uh, the plots on the right are attempts to predict the wellbore breakout width, in this case due to production or sand production. Uh, and so in this case, they, they went on to try to predict the actual volumes of sand that would be produced. And, but the color contours here are something we haven't talked about. And these are contours of equivalent plastic strain. So, and this gets to the point about the pointlessness of unconfined compressive strength, right? Um, if you remember, if you remember when we were talking about constitutive models for rocks, if we look at the stress strain curve, right? So if we if our material is just elastic, we have a stress strain curve that looks like that, right? Parameterized by Young's modulus. If it's elastic brittle, meaning it's it fails immediately without any sort of inelastic behavior, then you know it would just fail like that. Well, you know, for most rocks, uh, this is typically what you're measuring when you measure the unconfined compressive strain. Something, something about at that point right there. However, when you confine rocks and they have a pressure dependence, they can exhibit inelastic behavior. And so for, say, low confining pressures, you might just see a little bit of inelastic behavior and then failure. <coughs> for higher confining pressures, you might see Something like this, and then failure. So this this sort of softening effect that tends to at high confining pressures. You see that softening uh, due to pore collapse, right? So there's enough confining pressure on the rock, and you're inducing some shear deformation for whatever reason due to a stress concentration because you drilled a hole or your hydraulic fracturing or something. Uh, you can actually collapse the, collapse the pores permanently. Uh, and you'll, you'll have this sort of inelastic region. And if I, if I continue to go to even higher and higher confining pressures, you might see something like that, and you know, it, and, and and on and on. Right. Okay. So, if I were to follow any of these stress strain curves up the loading path, if I were to follow it up the loading path to some point before, say, ultimate failure, and, and when I say failure here, I'm talking about you know, the total loss of strength of rock, right? So, you know. <clears throat> and then stop loading it before that happens. I'm going to unload elastically. I'm going to unload elastically. Right? So this is the amount of permanent strain in the material. Right? That I'll never recover that strain. 
a, a permanently deformed rock. So this, this measurement right here is a measurement of equivalent plastic strain. Okay. And the more sophisticated, or let's say some more sophisticated failure models will have a criterion of equivalent plastic strain. So there's, say, evidence that at 4 or 5% equivalent plastic strain, then you're going to have material separation, actual breakaway. So that's one thing that's a little bit of a a little bit of a misnomer when we talk about failure models like the Moore Coulomb failure model. So we know the Moore Coulomb failure model, you know, if we look at say, you know, we have our our more circles and then we draw our failure line, right? Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that that if the material if the state of stress is say outside this line, that the material just fails in the sense that we, we have a total loss of strength, right? Because in a confined setting, what actually happens when you hit this failure surface is the material just undergoes shear deformation without additional force. So it's like slip or sliding, right? I mean, the, the whole model actually comes from, that's why the Coulomb and more Coulomb, it's from like Coulomb friction. And so when you hit this, when you hit this line, the material just undergoes additional shear without additional force. Right? And so you just have a sliding. Okay? But that doesn't mean you, you, you fail the material in the sense that it can hold no strength. It, it still has you know, the same amount of strength, up to some other criterion. And the better criterion here is this equivalent plastic strain criterion. And in that case, we can, it's, a, it's a more sophisticated model to determine when the material will actually separate at the wellbore and fake away and fade away. So these these simulations were, were, were finite element simulations where they actually have all of the all of the physics, the pore pressure, um, the plasticity model uh, to calculate the uh, equivalent plastic strain, and then uh, at failure, th that's what the contours are there. And so using this. Then, then they can come up with a better way to determine the wellbore breakout risk. And then, and then th so in this case, what they were studying was the effect of the drawdown rate on breakouts. And so, this was a f in the, this case when you had a five p 500 psi, what they called a slow drawdown. So this drawdown was done over, I think, 100 minutes. So 500 psi drawdown carried out over 100 minutes. Then you you're, you had uh, less than 60 degrees breakouts. Whereas, if you had a rapid drawdown, a thousand psi drawdown over 10 minutes, rapid was over 10 minutes. Then you had uh, breakouts in excess of 90 degrees. And the rate here matters because the rate implies how much now now you're actually computing the fluid dissolution in this in the you know in the matrix as it moves to the as it moves to the wellbore. And increases the pore pressure, right? So, this model had all, all of the physics, right? And so, in this case, um, they were able to basically put some bounds on now we know which direction we're going to drill, need to drill for stability, which, uh, you know, where we can do the kickoffs, and how fast we can produce these lateral legs we can make a decision on whether to case the wells or not. And in this, in this case, they, they decided that the risks w were of, you know, wellbore stability while drilling and in production and the locations where the kickoffs were allowed uh, for safety were too restricted. And so they decided to case all the wells. They, they decided that, that would be worth the cost. Okay. And the only way they could come to this conclusion was through this sort of full-up geomechanical model. So 